All right, welcome to our scene on pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is a packed topic, but we're gonna make it a lot of fun. So here we go. So it all begins with this guy over here. So this guy ended up on this island over here with this castle after his boat got wrecked. Well, let's take a look at his life vest over here. His life vest, which conveniently looks just like lungs, the rock got stuck in the pulmonary artery looking part of the vest. This is to remind us that a pulmonary embolism happens when an embolus or a blockage suddenly gets lodged in the pulmonary artery. This is dangerous because it can seriously decrease the amount of oxygenated blood that gets to the body. And this is of course because the lungs need to oxygenate the blood. So if the blood is not getting to the lungs, the blood will not get oxygenated. Okay, now back to the boy. So here is our boy over here, and he's passing by the entrance to the castle. And the first thing he notes is this interesting scene over here. This part of the scene is going to remind us of the associations that pulmonary embolism has to DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Pulmonary embolism is commonly due to a deep vein thrombosis, and this is when a clot gets dislodged, for example, from the leg, and travels through the right atrium into the pulmonary artery. And that's where the blockage is, and causes a blockage there. That's called a pulmonary thromboembolism. This is a life-threatening situation because blood gets blocked from getting into the lungs. Thus, the risk factors for a DVT will be the risk factors for a pulmonary embolism. So we have this soldier over here, and he doesn't move. He never moves. Inactivity, not moving, or stasis, is one of the risk factors for a DVT. We have this hyperjello over here, the hyperjello, or the hypercoagulable jello. Jello coagulates. This doubles remember the hypercoagulability. Hypercoagulability is another risk factor for developing a deep vein thrombosis. And this hyper jello over here is jumping on top of this N dough over here. It's the N dough. It's dough made out of N, and the N dough is getting destroyed. This is to help us remember that endothelial damage also predisposes a patient to deep vein thrombosis. And this is because the exposed collagen triggers the clotting cascade, making the patient more susceptible to a thrombosis. By the way, these three things represent the Virchow triad. Stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage. And while we're on the topic of deep vein thrombosis, we'll have this soldier's leg on fire. And this to help us remember two things. One, that the deep vein thrombosis generally originates from the deep veins of the lower extremity. And secondly, that the blood clot within the deep vein causes warmth and pain, as well as swelling and redness. Now, deep vein thrombosis is not the only cause of pulmonary embolism, but it is the most common cause. Soon we're going to talk about other causes of pulmonary embolus. But first, let's talk about what a pulmonary embolus leads to. So over here is the next part of the castle. This is kind of random, but there is this couple over here, and it's not working out. There's a mismatch. It's just not a match. The V and Q is not a match. The V and Q is not a match. This is to help us remember the VQ mismatch. Let's explain. In pulmonary embolism, fresh air is being ventilated into the lungs because the person is breathing normally, but there's no blood being perfused into that area since it's not getting there because of the blockage. There's a VQ mismatch, V representing ventilation and Q representing perfusion. It's this VQ mismatch that leads to the findings in a patient with pulmonary embolus. Our boy over here is hyperventilating. <laughs> In the scene, it's because he's scared. But for our purposes, it's to help us remember that the response to the VQ mismatch is hyperventilation to try to compensate for the missing oxygen. Hyperventilation, of course, leads to respiratory alkalosis because the patient is losing so much carbon dioxide. Let's take a look at this side of the castle for more of the symptoms. So here we see a chest that's in pain. For some reason, there's this random chest in pain. And this helps us remember the pleuritic chest pain that's seen in a patient with pulmonary embolus. The ox over here that's going down is to help us remember the hypoxemia, the low oxygen levels. And this is of course because of the lack of proper perfusion. In the castle over here, we notice the fast beating heart. And this helps us remember the tachycardia that develops. And this is in response to the re reduced blood flow to the lungs. And we notice this saddle over here next to the grave. This is to help us remember that if the embolism ends up in the pulmonary saddle, it could lead to sudden death, and that's because blood can't go to either one of the lungs. This leads to an electromechanical dissociation. And this means that although there's organized electrical depolarization of the heart, there is not going to be at the same time a synchronous myocardial fiber shortening, and therefore there won't be any cardiac output. Before we talk about the other causes of pulmonary embolism, let's talk about how diagnosis is made. So on top of the scene over here, we have a picture, we have an image of the CT pulmonary angiography. And that's because this is the imaging test of choice for pulmonary embolism. And this is where the physician looks for filling defects, as we see the arrows. 
In this image over here, we see the lines of Zahn, and these are interdigitating areas of pink which represent platelets and fibrin, and red, which represent red blood cells. And this is found only in thrombi formed before death. This helps distinguish pre- and post-mortem thrombi. Over here we note the random McDonald sign. Well, it's a white McDonald sign. And on top it says, call S1, Q3, T3 today. So the McDonald's white sign is gonna remind us of the McGinn white sign, also known as the S1, Q3, T3 sign. This is a finding seen on an ECG. And if you forget what this looks like on the ECG, we have a picture of that in the back of the castle. Here we see S1 and Q3 and T3. And just a reminder that a sinus tachycardia is the most common finding on the EKG. In the water over here, we notice these dirty dimes. Dirty dimes for D-dimers. The D-dimer blood tests can be used in diagnosis of pulmonary embolism to detect fibrin breakdown products. It's mainly used clinically to rule out DVT in low to moderate risk patients. And the last note we're going to make on diagnosis is seen on this sign over here. There's a sign that says West, and it's going to help us remember the Westermark sign. This is a checked x-ray finding in pulmonary embolus, in which there's increased translucency due to the impaired vascularization of the lung. Okay, finally, the best part of the scene, the fat bat. This fat bat is going to help us remember the other causes of pulmonary embolus. F for fat embolus, which is associated with long bone fractures and liposuction, with a classic triad of hypoxemia, neurologic abnormalities, and a particular rash. A is going to be for air embolus, in which nitrogen bubbles precipitate in ascending divers specifically, known as Cason's disease or decompression sickness. T is going to be for thrombosis, which we've mentioned already, DVT. B is going to be for bacteria embolus. A is going to be for amniotic fluid embolus typically occurring during labor or postpartum, but could actually be due also to uterine trauma. And T is going to be for tumor embolus. Okay, I know this scene was packed, but I hope you enjoyed. Take care.